On today's episode, it's back to the future at SpaceX. Today's episode of End of the Line is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.tv today. Well, the dust is settled at the SpaceX Boca Chica Texas launch site, and that dust that spends more than a little time bouncing around these days. The company's large Starship test vehicles, well, they're launching almost weekly these days, and last week's catastrophic failure of serial number 11 is the fourth consecutive explosion of a Starship vehicle. Now, for most engineering programs, loss of four large test vehicles in consecutive flights would result in a pink slip for a program manager, but one of the beauties of running your own business is that no one is looking over your shoulder when you decide to do things radically differently. Now, Elon Musk's strategy is simple. All-up system testing by building a lot of hardware, launching it frequently, and iterating their way to success. Now, the traditional aerospace way is to build components, test, screw those components into assemblies, test again, then bolt the assemblies into vehicles, and then test again. Then they test some more, and then launch. Now, this belt and suspenders approach, it does reduce risk, and it increases overall system reliability, but it's slow and it's expensive. What SpaceX does is something that actually has its origins in the mid-1950s. It's called concurrency. Of all the interesting facets of this program, a program which is a step towards space conquest, a program which every day takes us beyond the realm of the known, the concept closest to my heart is the idea we are using in the development operational area of this new weapon system. The core of the idea is simply this. At the same time we are developing the missile, we are working on operational actions to make it a practical, wor workable weapon system. Now, in the normal development, production, and operational cycle, we usually take steps in series. By that I mean we carry out a study program, and then a development and test program, and then we go into mass production before we finally introduce these weapons into the operational inventory. As a result, there is a long time period between the initiation of the development program until we get a new weapon system into the operational forces. We have attempted in the ballistic missile program to greatly reduce this time period. We have done this by what we call a management philosophy of concurrency. By this I mean that we at the same time are carrying out study, development, test, production, and operational actions. By this management concept of concurrency, we believe we can greatly compress the time from the initiation of our development program until we get our first units into the operational inventory. Now, this was done in the mid-1950s with the General Dynamics Atlas Missile Program, where the need for speed in the Cold War meant throwing away the highly conservative development methodologies of the airplane industry in favor of a build it, break it, modify it process. Now, in the Atlas program, the result was a bunch of catastrophic failures, so many that congressional inquiries, the news media, and even stand-up comedians began to question the competence of the American aerospace industry as a whole. Now, in the end, Atlas worked, and it worked well enough that it became a major satellite launch system for 50 years. During development, however, the General Dynamics team faced an unhappy U.S. Air Force customer, politicians circling like sharks, and nervous shareholders. In the meantime, the USAF had contracted a rival company, Martin, to build a second missile system as a backup plan. So the pressure was on, and there was no guarantee that the Atlas program would succeed. And if it hadn't, it likely would have driven General Dynamics out of the rocket business altogether. Now, more than a few engineers that I talk to in aerospace and other disciplines do wonder why SpaceX expends expensive test vehicles this way. Advanced simulations should be reducing the need for risky all-up system testing, and the failures so far appear to be engine-related, and also in the atmosphere, so test stand work would seem to be easier on equipment. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the SpaceX development process is that the normal bureaucracy in the form of an accident review board, followed by a report, recommendations, and a formal engineering change process, well, that's either so fast that the company rolls out the next rocket before the cause of a previous failure is fully known, or that the amount and quality of telemetry is now so large that post-flight analysis of hardware just isn't necessary anymore. And if the hardware itself is evolving quickly, it's also possible that every test flight represents an obsolete configuration, so there's a lot to learn and little to lose by turning those boosters into stainless steel confetti. 
but it doesn't look good. And like Atlas, a big string of catastrophic failures early in a program means that the mature system had better be reliable, like the company's other rocket program, Falcon. It worked in the 1950s and it should work today. Well, that's it for today's episode of End of the Line, brought to you by engineering.com. If you like this show, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell for our next episode. For deeper engineering content, visit engineering.tv for exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, not found here in our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.